Today's guest is nothing short of a sales powerhouse. He's done it all. He's earned 100,000 a month in commissions. He's built seven and eight figure businesses. He was the CEO of Seventh Level, now at Sales Sniper, and he's leading his newest venture, SDR Call Center. And in his past life, he was actually a real life sniper. Make sure you tune in to get some amazing insights from Matt Ryder. Like how did you start and build Sales Sniper, that company? So Sales Sniper, you know, as most things, it was sort of a, a happenstance, to be honest. I don't, I sort of didn't really go into it with, with that idea. Um, when, when I left, uh, I was um, part owner in a like chain of gyms called uh, Result Based Training. Um, guy was the face of it called Travis Jones and it was like 18 small group training studios. And so I had my own, uh, small group training studio in Sydney, in Bondi, um, which is actually still okay. running with my former business partner. And then I, um, uh, and then I like, we opened up another one with, with Travis in Sydney. And then what we did is, so I had one RBT and then Travis had a bunch. And then there was a few other owners that had like, and Travis owned like half of each one. Right. And so, um, and then from there, like we sort of all came together, everyone put all their gyms into one big company. And then, um, the goal was like, pull the profit and grow the businesses, you know? Um, and so I, I sort of did, uh, did that for a couple of years and I, I, I became sort of just like the default kind of like I was an owner and I ran two of the gyms and I was like the sales guy for like a bunch of the openings. And so um, and then like I sort of became the sales guy because I was sort of like the top salesperson. I wasn't very good, but like we didn't really have much of a choice. Like we, we had we had we would get 500 leads a month, which was name, email, phone number. And then we had to produce mm -hmm. 200 sales. You know, um, and so that was the economics of it. And so we, we sort of had to do that. And then we would do that. And that was how we opened the gym. And then we would get another, what would we do? We did 500 to get 200. And then we would do like 300 to get 100, 300 leads to get 100 sales because we were doing like four week challenges. And so okay. like, I just, I was just like full-time selling essentially. And then in between sales, I would go out and service the clients and do group sessions and stuff like that. And so <laughs> I got really unhappy with how the, with how that business was being run. Um, they, they, they wanted to open up a bunch of gyms at the same time. And I said, that's a, I don't think that's a good idea. And I had previously stated a few times like, oh, I don't like the way certain things are happening. And every time it mm. was like, I was like, I think this will happen. And it would happen, and then I would say, okay, next time listen to me, and then they would go, yep, and it was all like a voting system. And then the last time, exactly what I said would happen happened, and I was like, okay, guys, I'm fucking out of here. So I just literally like dissolved my equity. Like I was like, I'm out. Um, uh, and so like went back to my other gym that I still owned and that I was still business partners with him because me and him had gone into RBT together. So I ran that side and he ran the Bondi side. And then I'd sort of, I'd not been involved directly in that, but we were still partners in both the ventures. Um, and he wasn't sure. involved on the other side. I, I, for maybe like two years, I hadn't even like really needed to step in the gym. Um, and so I came back and he's like, oh man, like, you know, I've been running it for a while without you. So I don't really need you anymore. And I said, oh man, I've gotten pretty decent at sales. Like I can just be the sales guy. Like I don't need to, you can run the thing and just make me the sales guy. I'll take my dividends and equity and shit. He said no. And so he basically said like, you know, and listen, he's, an, he's a nice guy. He would, there was, I think someone was in his ear, but, um, you know, basically said, well, I haven't signed a new lease. So if you do come back, like I'm done. And I was like, all right. So we negotiated like a buyout and then, um, you know, I was sitting there, it was pretty shit. It wasn't much money. Um, but, uh, I was like, okay, well, what can I do now? Cause like, I thought I was going to do all this stuff. I'd spent all these years building gyms and now like, just sort of came back and got blindsided to be honest. And my wife was like eight months pregnant um, oh, wow. at, with our second at the time. And so I had like no money, like none, zero. Like I'm talking like not enough to pay rent. Right. Um, yeah. And so I was like, all right, well, I'm pretty decent at selling. 
So what I did is I like called everyone that I knew because I've been running gyms for a long time. And so I knew a lot of people that had yeah. similar gyms and I was like, Hey, I'll be your sales guy. Cause the hardest thing was like the balance between sales and fulfillment and, you know, like doing, doing the mark, doing, doing everything. I was like, I'll be your sales guy. I think it was $375 a week base. And then like 22 bucks a sale or something like that. I was charging for like a, for like a, usually I was selling like a six week for like 700 bucks type thing. Right. And wow. I would just sell it over the phone and I would take payment over the phone. And that's like was my sort of skill set was most people had them go into the gym. And so like but there was a drop off. So I just didn't see the point. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I did that and I ended up working with like a few different gyms at the same time. And then um, like kind of word got out about that. And then the <laughs> <coughs> sorry, I'm just recovering from a bit of a flu. Um, <coughs> so. Like I ended up with like five gyms all in Australia that I was kind of doing the sales for. And then I was like, oh, okay. So like I was making probably like, I was making more money than what I probably ever had, to be honest. Um, I was probably making like 10 grand a month at that stage. Uh, yeah. And then I was like, oh, this has gone pretty well. This is kind of an interesting thing. Like, what am I? And I was like, oh, I think this is like a sales agency, you know, type thing. I didn't really know what it was. And then, um, yeah. And then from there, like the marketers for the gyms reached out to me. And like ended up just like flooding me with referrals, like flooding me like I'm like an like an astronomical amount of referrals, like hundreds. And so oh, wow. sure. I just sort of like started picking the gyms that I could handle, and then like trying to get people on board. And you know, like um, it was a, it was interesting. We I grew to like fifty gyms really quickly, and then it was like too much, and then I had to fire like thirty of them. <laughs> it was just it was too hard. And like, what I do you think? Sales guys. What 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 do you think happened there? I was gonna say, yeah, what do you think happened there to cause you to have to I mean, I know you scaled very quickly, fifties a you know, fuckload very quickly. Yeah, yeah. But what was the catalyst of having to like scale back so quickly? It was just like I didn't have any it was just like trying to replicate me, you know? And so like there really isn't really any like any systems or processes. It was like so like and like, you know, I didn't know anything about the industry. So I knew nothing about uh, how to call leads. So I had to figure out how to call leads in different countries, right? Because I was like time zone hopping and doing, um, I was like going like across the world, right? So I could like start at like 5 a.m. and then sell till like 10 p.m., but in the peak times. So I had like a little mm. global chart of like like 9 to 11 a.m., right? Local time. And I could just like go all around like that and then come back to Sydney, you know what I mean? And then go over to Adelaide, then go down to Perth and then like head over to the UK, you know? And so like I had to figure out all this shit by myself and I didn't know how to use any CRMs. I'd never used a CRM. Um, and so I kind of had to figure it all out, you know? Like, I used this like Chrome extension called Crazy Call where I would just call leads and it was like 10, it's like a buck for a phone number or some shit like that. And, <laughs> and I would use Skype and I would, yeah, yeah, it was like just lots of shit, man. Like I was just selling all day. I was probably selling at that point, realistically, without exaggerating, 16 hours a day. I think wow. I was probably on the phones for 16 hours a day. And then, yeah, just kind of like I scaled it back and then like grew it back up again. And I think we grew it up to like probably 35, 40 gyms with like 10 sales guys. Each sales guy would do like three gyms. Um, and is that still your like the main focus for sales sniper or what did it end up transitioning to? No, it's a good question. I, um, I ended up getting asked by one of the marketing companies, um, a guy called Riley. I was still a good relationship for more gym members. He was like an Australian guy. And um, hmm. he was like, oh, do you want to like try selling our marketing services to gyms? And I was like, yeah, I guess. Fuck. It's like a $7,500 uh, like marketing package, right? For like three months yeah. or whatever it was for gyms. And he was like, how much money do you want for comms? And I was like, I don't know, mate, like 300 bucks. Like that seems outrageous. And he was like, oh, I'll give you 400. And I was like, sweet. Meanwhile, <laughs> another sales guy that was getting like, I think probably well over a thousand. But <laughs> I, I said it. I remember I called a mate of mine. I was like, this fucking idiot's going to give me 400 bucks to close a deal. Like, this is the stupidest thing ever. Right. And so, um, I had 16 sales calls and I closed 15 of them <laughs> because like they were gym owners <clears throat> and they needed leads yeah. and it seemed like it made sense, you know? And like I spoke gym owner. And so mm. like, it was really just through like, I had a good, like, you know, I had a good way of talking to them, I guess it wasn't much, I don't think it was much sales prowess, but, <laughs> and then from there, like I started looking, I like made money and I was like, fuck, I just made like more money in like a week than I ever have in a month. 
And I was like, what is this high ticket sales space? So I started Googling stuff and I was like Googling Dan Locke and watching videos. And then like a, um, like a video came up <coughs> of like Taylor Welch and he had like a sales mentor. He's actually a yeah. friend of mine these days, which is pretty funny. Um, and, um, yeah, they, they were like, had this $97 21 day sales challenge. And just before that started, I had um, started selling for this business coach and it was like two grand a sale. It was like a 30K product. It was two grand okay. a sale, but it was up front. So it was a really good comms deal, to be honest. Like, um, And uh, so I was like selling probably like two, two to three a week at that point I was probably selling, right? Like hustle, muscle, going hard. I was like the top sales rep um, in that, like, like in that company. And then sort of did this 21 day sales challenge and then sort of like destroyed everybody like <laughs> close rate cash collected. Like <clears throat> so, and then from there, um, I started like getting a, a name for myself, I suppose. And then, mm. so people were doing gyms and I was doing the high ticket stuff. Okay. Like my sales guys were doing gyms. And then I was like, I started getting so much, so many people messaging me about like done for you sales or me being their sales guy that I was like, oh, okay, well maybe I can transition to this. And so we sort of like got together me and my business partner at the time, James, and we we're like, let's fucking fire the gyms and just go hard in the paint on the high ticket because like it's 20 sales to make half what we make on one high ticket sale. So then, and then, um, I was like, well, I don't know how we're going to get clients and, and sales reps. And I was like, I guess I'll just do lots of content. So I just started doing like daily posting on my Facebook videos and shit. And then I um, just started getting more clients and then more referrals because like I was an external sales guy that could come in and sort of, I would sell it, right? And then I would teach someone how to sell it from my team and then get them off and then I would go to the next one. So I would come in, sell, establish, boom. So it was like we always had a really good first impression because I was the sales guy. And then I met what Jeremy, level uh, oh. throughout that process. I, I was going to ask, like, what what level do you were you coming in at, like with the companies when you first started? Like what most of them had they were, been selling to? Most of them were like say like at that stage where the founder wants to stop selling, so fifty to a hundred k a month type stuff. You know, some of them were way higher. Some of them were like they had uh, an internal team and they wanted to split test an external team, which I don't, I don't do these days. I don't, allow, I don't, I would never do that. Um, it just doesn't, it's just a bad vibe, right? Um, uh, but yeah, it's sort of, you know, and I've, I've had startups, but like they had money, you know? Um, gotcha. It really, <laughs> it's all over the shop, to be honest. I've never been really good at like picking a winner. Okay. Like it's really just kind of like finger in a bunch of pies kind of thing. Yeah. Like, I mean, with, with the sales sniper specifically, like with my own business, I know how to pick a winner, but when it comes to like sales sniper, there's no way to know. It's sort of like hiring a sales guy. Like, how do you know they're any good? You can role play with them, but they can still be shit. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, for sure. Don't know. You know I mean? So, um, but yeah. And then from there, like uh, I, I met Jeremy, um, when I was selling on this offer, um, this business coaching offer and sales sniper was going, I think by the time I met Jeremy sales sniper was probably doing a couple hundred grand a month. We went from like zero okay. to 10 and then like to 50, I would say it only took man, 50 K a month. I would say, man, that, that didn't take more than four or five months. And then it was like a hundred, probably a couple months after that we were at two and a half million within two years a month. Wow. Um, and what do you, what do you think caused it to scale so quickly? I mean, especially that first zero to 50 or 10 to 50 K. What do you think allowed you I to mean, I was yourself? Guy and, and I was just, <laughs> just relentless, <coughs> very effective salesperson. Like people could argue that like there are more skilled salespeople, like for sure, whatever, but nobody can outsell me. It's just a fact. Like it, it's, I mean, like it's very difficult to, you know, like when I'm like, I sell a lot, like even now, like these days I sell a lot of stuff. Um, and so it's just because like, there's a, there's like the art of being good at sales and there's the art of making sales and they're different things. And so mm, like, can you explain the difference? Like there's like creating, like I tell people all the time, like create an environment around yourself where like the sales are constantly coming to you. Right. But that, that requires constant activity. 
you know? So you have mm-hmm. to constantly be bringing and working deals constantly, nonstop. And I do that all day, every day, like, and I have for a long time. And I try and keep really good relationships and I say yes to a lot of things. And so I'm generous with my time to some degree. Um, and then like, so I end up having good relationships with people. And so I get a lot of referrals. I probably get five to seven referrals a week. Um, wow for different things, whether it's for like coaching, I don't do a lot of coaching, but I'll, I'll coach some business owners. Right. Yeah. Um, like two at a time I'll kind of do. Uh, and then, um, you know, we have the call center. The big focus is the dialer, which is the software, which the call center runs on. Like that's the big focus. The call center Mm -hmm. was like a market penetration play because nobody cares if I create like a software, like everyone's like, all right, weirdo. Like, but if I create a call center that will call your leads for you, then people will be interested in that. But the yeah. only metrics I ever spoke about was like pickup rates and contact rates and speed to lead and stuff like that, which is, and then the dialer launched and I've, I'll probably have a thousand seats in the first three months of launching. Like I signed a deal for 327 seats the other day. Like we'll be one of the fastest growing software companies like that hasn't borrowed money probably ever. Like I would say fastest to fastest to a million dollars ARR. Like, it'd be pretty hard to beat us on a seat base allocation, like not like some crazy expensive software, but like we'll have, I, I reckon by the end of Q1, like the US Q1, by the end of March, we'll probably have 1500 seats. <coughs> What's the plan with that company? Sell it. Like, what do you want to take it to? Sell it? Yeah. Sell it for a lot of money. What do you want to, there, do you have a number in mind that you want to sell it for? Um, if I can walk away with uh, 40 million in my <coughs> I'll be very happy. Even tw- tw- 25 would be a number. Like if I could w- take home 25, I'm um, mm. sweet mate. Like people be like, Oh, but you could sell it for a billion in two years time. I don't give a fuck mate. Like, I don't know. I don't need a billion dollars. <laughs> like what am I going to do with a billion dollars? Um, like, so like, so that would mean we probably have to sell it for a hundred. I have a business partner. Um, who's a great dude. Um, and then after taxes and whatnot, um, you sure. know, sell it for a hundred million, which is very doable. I know I can get a business to 10 million and that business can have a 10 X rev valuation pretty easily mm. because it's like true SaaS. um, with it, with a service line on top as a back end back sell, which is very profitable and with fast growth and not taking money. And it's not like influencer based. Like we get ton- like uh, we book five sales calls a day, four to five a day with zero marketing, <laughs> zero. <laughs> Like we haven't launched ads yet. Our HubSpot's being set up at the moment. Our website got finished like yesterday. Like it's still me and Declan like doing sales copy. You know what I mean? Like we've got nothing. <laughs> That's we've awesome. got nothing. There's like five people in that whole company. <clears throat> it's all product focused, but like we have a really good plan and a fucking great product. Like Jesus, it's a good product. Like 25% pickup rates. So Cole yeah. just signed to come over. So he's bringing his Did business he? over. Yeah. Um, Taylor Welch is coming over. Um, Russ Rafino is on our system. Um, like it basically like the entire coaching industry will be on that dialer within six to eight months because it's, I mean, if you're getting 3% pickup rates and you're making a hundred K a month, if you get 20% pickup rates, you'll probably make 150 with the same leads mm. because you just, and what it to five times the people. What what is the cost of the seats on that? Are are you having like a minimums or are you three what are your kind of like plan? Three seats that? minimum, and it's uh, two fifty <clears throat> per month. Okay. Which, like, well, I mean, which like, yeah, it's and and we manage the dial and we actually do like the back end for you, so we have like our own tech stack. Like, I mean, it's our own software, but we have our, a bunch of our own stuff, and then we have like analytics people that look at the analytics and then make tweaks to your campaigns to like tweak and increase pickup rates and shits and that which is all baked into the seat fee which is super scalable too we can scale that up to like ten thousand seats pretty easily um because like it's like we'll 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 be able to train an ai to do it within like a year but we just don't have the time to do that right now but um yeah man it's fucking pretty dope it was the biggest issue that i saw in the industry and so i was like if i can solve that i'll be a billionaire well, I was going to ask, how how did you go from, I mean, I, I know we jumped there a little bit, but how did you go from with Sales Sniper? You said you were just meeting 
Jeremy Miner when you were selling that business coaching and yeah. you had Sales Sniper kind of running in the background. How did that kind of transition you, I guess, to coming into, um, well, seventh level to start off? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So me, me and Jeremy got along really well. We still do. Like, um, he's a fucking true mentor of mine. Like, the dude infuriates me to no end. Um, <laughs> but he will always have a, he He gave me the freedom to never have to worry about money. Right? So, like, I'll, I'll always, like, you know, I don't work with him anymore. Like, I don't work with 7th Level. Like, I sold my equity. Um, but I'll always, like, look out for that dude. Like, he's, you know. Um, because he, he genuinely changed my life. And if you want sales training, don't ask me, go to fucking seventh level, right? Like any PQ is the best. It is the best as long as you're not dumb. Like if you're a dumb, dumb, like a self and you're a self proclaimed dumb, dumb, just <laughs> don't do it. Like, and that's not saying like, that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying like that is a, but if like, if you, if you can't grasp like sort of more, some more complex things, then like, don't look to you know, throw everything out the window and go full NPQ because I think it's like, it's the thinking man's game, right? Like gotcha. once you figure it out, it is fucking lethal, right? But some people struggle to figure it out. Do you know what I mean? Like that's just the way. And when you, when you partnered up with Jeremy, how did that look? Like, how did that go from you, you know, I'm selling saying, for yeah. him? I'm quite, I'm quite <laughs> to big CEO. Um, I'm quite strategic. Like, um, <laughs> I know that like I can present very well. And so if I can get in front of people, I, I, I can ask three questions and then they'll approach me, right? If you mm. ask a really good question, you're smart, right? And smart identifies smart. I'm quite intelligent. Like I've been tested. I have an IQ of well over 150, right? So like I'm quite smart, right? Um, and so like that gives me a distinct advantage and I'm very open about that. Like my problem solving capabilities are very, very good. And so like, and I was given that, that's a gift, right? Like I didn't earn that. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, whatever, I'm quite lucky, but I have dyslexia, I have ADHD. Like, you know, those things kind of all go together, you know? So there's like a bit of a chaos to it, but um, uh, like I can barely fucking read. Like reading is a struggle. Um, but, um, but you're in sales. You, you don't need to read, right? <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. <laughs> Reads, readings for losers and back end people. Um, and so, uh, yeah. And, and so, you know, I was, uh, I got sales training from Jeremy, um, back when it was like one-on-one -on -one, because like the seventh level was a thing, but it wasn't a thing, right? Like it's hard to kind of explain. Like he'd been trying for a number of years to try and get seventh level off the ground, but he's not a business guy. He's a sales yeah. phenom. So like, but he has a very expensive lifestyle in the same way that I do now. I didn't understand it when I met him. Right. Like, but like my house costs, like it's worth about 10 mil. Right. So like it's expensive, you know, um, to live, uh, you know, in where, where I live and all that kind of stuff and kids and schools and all that kind of shit. So I didn't get it at the time when I met him because I remember, anyway, I'll tell that story in a second, but, um, I did coaching with him. I gave him 80% of all the money I had. It was 50, it was, uh, 40,000, right. U S and I had like mm -hmm. 50,000 US total. And like, I remember he sold me by a DM. I still have all the DMs. He sold me by a DM basically with like voice notes. And like, I was so nervous that he wasn't going to let me pay him when it came down to like the actual sales call. And he fucking made that dude tore me open. I had no chance, like no chance. And I didn't know him from Adam, bro. Like I saw one video with him with Eli and I was friends with Eli Wild. And like bought his two thousand dollar course, bought like the NEPQ two point oh, like the like like the like original mm -hmm. one. And I was like, "Fuck, this is good," but there are some pieces missing here. Like, and I went through the portal. I still hold the record for the most amount of times going through the portal. Like, like go in there. It's hundreds, hundreds of times I've been through it. Right? Um, like, because I can see all the logins, and my name is so far above everybody else's. The number two guy is Sean Jones. Another guy, Cold Caller, makes about one hundred fifty k a month. Really, really solid dude. Cold Caller. Right. Um, fucking savage. You're on the cold calling, go to fucking Sean Jones. <laughs> um, um, I think he's one of the coaches at seventh level. Actually he does like two sessions a week. Um, oh. yeah. The reason why they have good coaching, the system that we put in place there was like, get people who are extremely <coughs> good at it, who we, who we yeah. taught and just pay them like an hourly rate to do like two hours a week. So they get paid like a thousand bucks an hour, right. For two sessions a week. So they get paid like 2000 bucks a week. But like if we paid him any less, they'd fucking, they wouldn't do it. 
Do you mean? But they do it because it's a favor to us because we taught them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's sort of like the the back and forth. You know, so that's why the coaches there are so good because they're guys who do it. You know, mm. whereas like it's not like. You know, it's not like pretend pretendies, like guys who used to sell. Yeah. You know, that was me and Jeremy. We were guys who used to sell. But, um, but yeah, so um, I'm losing track. But, uh, yeah, so anyway, I did one-on-one -on -one with Jeremy. And um, I sort of – I started – like I asked a couple questions that he could tell. He was like, oh, okay. Yeah, you're you're one of the ones that can figure this out. Um, like what? So, well, one of the questions I asked, because he does a lot of inflections and tonality and stuff like that, and I was like, he said, like, why is this important to you now, though? And I said, okay, did you pause before the now and then emphasize now so you could make that person think time frame so that the answer is more predictable? And he goes, that's exactly why I did it. And he goes, in all my years of coaching people, you're the only person to figure that out by yourself. Mm -hmm. Right? And he, and he goes, like, I go, yeah, it makes sense. And he goes, do you want to be my sales guy? Like there and then. Just on the spot. Yeah. That was after like our fourth or fifth session, I think. Um, and we'd be going back and forth on Voxer. And I was really prepared for my sessions. Right? Like I had like snippets of like little bits of calls and stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah. And so it was really interesting. Um, and uh, yeah. And then I was like, okay, what have you got? And I was still selling on this Australian offer. Um, but I was like, yeah, I can do U.S. times as well. So I could do like a full day Australian, full day U.S. I was living in Perth, right, which is like garbage time for U.S. But like it meant that you could basically do two full-time jobs, right? I was like, fuck it. Yeah. And so I went in as a sales guy and they had these marketing people in there. Um, and they were like, okay, so it's two weeks before we launch funnels. And I was like, fuck that. I got kids to feed. I was like, where are people? And they had started this Facebook group. It had 900 people in it. I reckon that Facebook group now has probably got a couple hundred thousand, right? The Sales Revolution group. And so yeah. I was like, sweet, I'll just start farming people. And I had a name in high ticket already. And Jeremy really didn't. Mm. And so all the first clients were high ticket because they were people in my network. Yeah, and so okay. I was like, hey, I'm making at that time like 40, 50 grand a month, right? As a closer. You know what I mean? I was doing mm -hmm. daily content. I was doing the whole thing. And um, so I, I started inviting everybody over to Sales Revolution Group. And like I was posting on my Facebook and I was saying, like, Jeremy taught me all this stuff, which he did. And so, and then I started growing to like 100 grand a month, like getting like after that, you know what I mean? Sort of growing up and up and up as my close rates and show rates will increase from using an EPQ. And then from there, um, <laughs> yeah, man, like, so like the first six months, it was just all high ticket guys, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, um, a lot of it was from my network, from Eli Wilde's network, right? Because like they had done stuff together, and then like that gave us time to like build, to like get Jeremy over full time, have him start the content machine, and then we made the active decision of like, okay, like after, like I didn't like the the deal he had. He had given like a fifty percent rev share, and I was like, this doesn't seem fair to all these people. So then I came in and I said, hey man, like I've got Sales Sniper. Sales Sniper was doing well over a million a month at this point. Right. And so I was like, hey, I've got some infrastructure over here. Why don't we borrow some of the infrastructure that I have at Sales Sniper? And, you know, we can get all those people out of seventh level, get you over full time, basically pay him 100% of the revenue. Right. But he was doing all the coaching, which is fine. But I wasn't taking my commissions or anything for a while. And I was like, mm. let's just build this thing up. And he offered me 50% of the company. And I said, no. I probably should have said yes. I said, I'll take 20%. Why'd you say no? I just felt like the dude had spent 20 years putting together any PQ. And for me, just because I like, you know, I, I felt like that's where the value of the company was. Um, and so mm -hmm. I said, I'll take 25%. I feel like that's a fair, you know, I felt like you spend 20 years and just because I've spent two years getting good at something, but you spent 20 years like, you know, I've, this is ridiculous. And so anyway, I, I, I said that. I don't regret it. I would have, I would have made, I mean, eh, yeah, I don't regret it, but, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, you know, and then we kind of went on our way and then over the course of the years, like, you know, they, they both grew at its peak. They were both doing at its peak at, at, when they were both, like they were both around the two, two and a half a month. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then like it just got too big and the money was, so, there's so much more profit at seventh level that I started to scale down sales sniper. Um, and focus gotcha. on seventh. Sales never never stopped. It just scaled down to where there wasn't fifty accounts. Because what like, did it scale it was, down to? Uh, like what like was manageable 10. on the side?
like 10. Gotcha. Now, and then I pivoted away from done for you sales entirely and just do like the sales management stuff. Okay. Yeah. So how did that differ from the done for you side? Like the done for you is like, it's just a complete sales infrastructure from top to bottom. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the only problem with that is like, it ends up being, you know, it ends up being like, for example, like I had a, I had an offer, I got them to 3 million a month from zero in six months. Crypto, hot offer, right? I'm not saying it was all me, but we had a phenomenal row. I had a great sales system. But like, you know, you're, you're getting charging people like 25%, right? Because it's a complete infrastructure and there's no base. There's no, there's a ton of risk on behalf of the sales agency. You know what I mean? And then you can't control shit. So like you've got all your tech people, your ops people, your finance people are tracking everything. You're paying the reps. You're doing this in the hopes that this guy doesn't fuck you in any way. Right. Or, or like shit, the bad, the marketing goes down. You have no control over the marketing. Right. Um, and so you have a ton of operational risk. And so like, you know, um, and then the bills get so big, you know, these guys are paying me 500, 600 grand a month, one client at us. Mm. Right. Yeah. And it's like, they don't want to pay that bill when they can pay their sales guys 10%. They can just go through copy everything I've done and then replicate it inside. Do you know what I mean? And like, I don't mind yeah. if they do that, if they tell me, because I'll help them do it. Like, so after some experiences like that, um, which isn't even like a bad experience, I'm just saying like, after seeing that happen a bunch of times, I started basically going like, hey, this is what's going to happen. We'll get you to a million dollars a month and you're going to start hating paying my bill because it's 200 something thousand dollars a month and no one likes paying anyone $200,000 a month, right? No matter how good a job they're doing, right? And so like, we'll get to that point and then we'll look at staffing your team internally. And then we'll manage it and stuff like that, right? So we'll get a closer in, train him, manage him, take a 5% override. Boom, 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 like that. And that created a better one. Like with Ryan Surhant, that's how we did it. Um, a bunch of other people, like that's how we did it. And then it was like the done for you, it was like, you know, I started saying like, I reckon it's better for your business if I just come in, set everything up, staff it, you pay them, right? They're your, mm. your, your, your tech like I'll create the system, but it's your tech, they're your reps, right? And I take a fee of like 7K a month and 5% of revenue, right? Is that kind of so, like the standard that you did? Yeah, that's what I started doing like a couple of years ago because like it just started pivoting and it's just way easier. Like, um, and like there's just way less operational complexity from the sales sniper side. Like I don't have to manage all the reps because like, you know, if you have 50 reps, you have to have a couple people just wrangling them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so for sure. You, or you end up having like managers that manage managers that manage, and then like that's where agencies die, right? Whereas like I can do, I can probably honestly, man, like I can do eight sales management clients by myself, like it's a breeze, right? Okay. Like I know how to do that. That's easy, right? Um, so like right now, I think we have like I don't know, like twelve, fourteen, something like that, sales management clients. And is that like when you say you do eight to 10 of them yourself easily, is that because you've insulated, you put in uh, a sales leader, a sales manager, and then you're more dealing with that person or is it you're yeah, still dealing with the, that team directly? Yeah. No, there's a doer. Right. <laughs> the doer gets like, I charge like usually like five to seven K a month and like 5% rev or something like that. And the, the doer will get like two K and 2%. They'll okay. do all the work, but they'll do like three accounts. You know what I mean? Yeah, okay. So they'll make 15, whatever, 20, depending on the size of the accounts. Do you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. And then, like, but I can do, you know, part-time I can do 10. Like, that's easy. <laughs> that's really easy. Like, it really is. It's because, like, they're, they know what they're doing. So I just have to meet with them for, like, an hour a week. That's it. And I might meet with the business owner. We do projections, and I help them. Do you know what I mean? So it's like I'm helping the mm -hmm. business owner, and I help my guy. Or if they have a really good internal sales manager, then like I'll just use that guy and I'll just take all of it. Okay. And what what do you think led you to wanting to – like I know you made the shift from done-for-you sales into the management side. What, you said there you had a few people that had kind of not fucked you over, but you've kind of gone through it. You've seen the recipe happen time and time and time again. Was there one in particular that you're like – Ah, yeah, okay. That that's done with the agency side for the done for you. Um, to be honest, more of it was like the the people who just because it's like a lot of it's comms only. 
Like they just take forever to do shit or like you get influencers where it's like, it's not their main business. Right. Okay. Like it's like their side or like a big one was like, uh, was like click funnels. Right. So I ran Russell Brunson stuff for probably like eight or nine months. Right. For all their mastermind mm-hmm. sales. It's not their focus. Right. Mm. So when it's not their yeah. focus, it's very difficult to get the things that you need done to do it properly. And so you're constantly trying to like band aid solution, everything. And so, like, I literally, they, they came to me with, like, um, hey, we want you to hit these, these numbers. And I mapped out, like, exactly what they had to do, right? And this was literally the conversation. was like, was like okay, um, so I need this. These exact things, I'll do yada, 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 right? And, like, for, like leads. Like, this is, for, forget the money that you want me to make you. You need to give me this many leads. Oh, sorry. And, like, none of it was unreasonable. And they were like, okay, well, we, 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 we can't do that right now. And I was like, oh, then I can't hit the number. And they go, oh, we need you to hit the number. I go, but mate, I, like, I'm just not, it's not miracles. Like, I can't produce you more money with less leads. Like, that's just not the way it works, right? And so um, they just went like, well, I just said like, man, I'm not going to like agree to something that – this is like after months. And I was like, I can't agree to something that like is physically impossible because it just makes me look like an idiot. And I was yeah, like, well, it's not realistic on any side. And so I said, like, if you guys want me to hit that number, I can do it, but I need this from you. And then I'll do all this stuff on this side. And I was like, and then we'll be happy days. And they were like, well, we're not going to do that. And I was like, well, then, okay, I, peace be with you. You know, it wasn't a bad thing. It was just like, okay, like, we're done. You know what I mean? Because, yeah. like, what is the point? And so, like, and it was fine. Like, I understood, like, what they wanted. It's just like from the numbers that I that I had and all the all the like very detailed projections and where every lead is going, I knew everything. And I had a very efficient system in there that was a lot of hustle muscle. Like we were doing like thirty thousand dials a month, right? Just trying to sure. like mir- miracle shit, right? Um and again it's nothing against them, but it wasn't their focus. It's like they're this is a nice to have revenue stream. So they're not gonna fuck with their main money earner that earns them, you know, three hundred million dollars a year. Right. To, to make some extra coaching sales. Like, why would they give a fuck? You know? And it's like, yeah. totally fair enough, man. Like, don't, don't <clears> be <throat> pain. Right. And so like, it, like, but that kind of stuff is pretty common, you know? So like, you know, slow business owners. Um, and sometimes like we just shit the bed. Like, I, I mean, we've had that where like, we just had sales guys that just didn't do shit and didn't produce like that. That's happened um, for sure. Right. And so like, you know, but a lot of the time it's um, just the, the business owners, like having one lead source, and then that lead source goes down and it's like, mm-hmm. and because we're comms only, there's no, like, there's, there's no mad rush, right? Cause they're not paying for it. But if you charge them 15 grand a month, they're going to do it faster, but they'll probably just end up getting rid of you. Do you know what I mean? Because like, they don't want to hold the fee and yeah. they don't know how long it's going to take to get back and all that kind of stuff. So that's really most of the issues with the sales agency come, comes around those things. So you got to sign did up you five see- one good one, you know? What what were the major things that when you'd like go into a, a team, right? Like when you were doing more of the management side, what are like the first things that you look at that you'd break down to get those quick wins? Um, a lot of the time, I mean, there's, you got to have a look at the stats and say, what, what are the needle movers? Like at the moment I put them straight onto my dialer. Like, yeah, okay. cause I can, I can get your lead to set from 5% to 20% almost immediately just because you, you have a high pickup rate. Right, you know, so that's a really fast one. But then you look at like show rates, you look at close rates. I very rarely touch like the close rates at all for even like the first two months, three months. Like, don't even touch the scripts or anything. It seems like it's like it's just kind of wasted time a lot of the time. So just have a look at like what are like the process things that we can fix that don't involve skill. You know what I mean? Um, break up the sales team so it's like you know I would put like lead routing in like straight away. The best guys get the best calls. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like straight away. Um, and then focus on like speed to lead, lead to set, lead routing. Those are probably the things that I think probably move the needle the biggest. And you can do them in the background. You know? Yeah, okay. And then just get rid of Deadwood, like lazy reps, like inbound only mm-hmm. closer guys who are like, I'm special. It's like you're not. You know, I, I've got 100 <laughs> of you. I've got 100 of you at the ready. Like you're not special. And if you think you are, that that's a problem, you know? Yeah. So it's like, unless you're closing to like 50% plus, like you're, you're not special. You know what I mean? So, mm. and getting rid of those people quickly. Because there's tons of attitude out there with people who are like, 
oh, like, protect your time. It's like, motherfucker, you don't make any money. Don't protect your time. Like, I don't protect Your time is worthless. <laughs> yeah, but it's not even that. Your time is obviously very worth to you, but it's not worth much to the company. Like, you know, fuck, man. Like, you know, like, I don't know you from Adam, mate. I'll jump on your podcast for an hour. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. like, I make multi seven figures a year personal income. This has probably cost me 10 grand. You know what I mean? Like, like if you look at it that way. Not wrong. Right? So it's like, it's like, but like some closer it doesn't want to fucking speak to a guy because he didn't meet some sort of income threshold that he wouldn't meet. It's madness. It's like, what are you talking about? How are you supposed to get good if you don't talk to people? You know, like it's just yeah, I, crazy, man. It's just a bunch of fucking, you know what I mean? Like, and all these people that teach him, they fucking live in like Bali or they live in like fucking like cheap countries. It's like, you ever wonder why they have to live there? <laughs> you ever wonder why the guy's teaching you how to make money live in countries where the cost of fucking living is nothing? You know, you know how easy it is to bowl out in fucking Ecuador? You know? <laughs> it's a lot easier than Australia, I'll say that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it just, it's like, and there's nothing against them, but it's just like, I just don't like people telling people bullshit stories. You know? Mm -hmm. It's like, if you want to be good, you have to work really, really hard. And like, chances are the person who's making the most amount of money on a consistent basis in sales is the person who works the absolute hardest. Like, that's just, you know, common trait, right? And it's like, mm -hmm. um, you know, people who tell you there's a right way and a wrong way of doing things, it's like, probably not. You know, there's probably a thousand different ways that you could do it. And I'm sure that if they're done well, you probably have a great response either way, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what do you like, I guess, what would be your advice now that you've had so much, like you, you've built all the teams, you, you've done all the calls, like literally probably more than anyone else I could say I know um, in terms of sales calls, what would you boil it down to when someone's getting started? What would you want them to do for the first year to be able to put themselves on that success route? I think like you, you've got to like, uh, you, you want to put yourself, I think, in uh, like difficult sales environments like you know i think um you know selling something really high volume low ticket i think high ticket is a really dangerous place to start because like there's too much pressure you know like mm -hmm. it's the reason why i'm so ruthless like when it comes to like looking at a new team is because like that business owner spent a lot of money on those leads man so like it, you know if if a sales call costs 200 bucks right like a good closer will have a high show rate right? The show rate has a lot to do with the closer. You know what I mean? Because like, there's a ton mm -hmm. of things that you can do in order to have a really high show rate. And I proved that this year there was an offer that, um, that I was managing and it was a, like a business owner niche. They had nothing to do with me. Like none of those people would have known yeah. who I am. It was totally outside of like, and so they all had like 35% show rates to sales call, right? This is from like, this is from the funnel. And I was like, let me have a look. So I hopped on the calendar for two weeks. I did not have a single no-show. Right? Oh. I just put myself on the rotator. And so mm. as soon as – and I'm way busier than all these people. As soon as I had a sales call book in, I had a notification on my phone. Right? I texted them yeah. immediately. I'd go onto their website based off their email. Go onto their website and go, hey, man, just had a look through your website. so that you booked a call with me about XYZ on XYZ's day. Um, you know, I've got a few questions for you, but is there anything that you need from me to make that a more productive call? Mate, every single one of them showed up. I think I had like two cancellations in two weeks. Every single one showed up because I just was shown to be a professional to take the effort to do the thing. And I was like, how the fuck am I on a rotator like from ads and I have a hundred percent show rate and you motherfuckers have 30. I was like, clearly it's a you thing, guys. Stop being so fucking lazy. Oh, you mean, can't we just do the automations? You lazy fuck. God, it's disgusting. You know what I mean? And it's not like, it's not me having a rant. It's just like, you know, if that was a fucking dude, if that was a dude in Snipers back in the day, and be like, oh, I have to, I have to fucking, I have to fucking put my own scope on. Ugh. You'd be like, get the fuck out, bro. You just kick him out of the unit. You wouldn't even think twice. You'd be like, oh, I don't need you here, mate. Like, if you think that's too hard, Jesus Christ. You know I was going to say, how much do you, how much do you feel like how you approach sales now and how you like run everything comes back from your, your time in the military. Cause I mean, I know we didn't talk on this today, but if you want to just give a quick summary of what you yeah, did. I was, military, a, I was a, cool. a, a, a sniper in uh, like a tier Australian tier one special operations group called two commander regiment. Um, 
Uh, but, but yeah, like, you know, I don't know, to be honest, it's a hard question because man management in the military is like comically terrible. And most people who stay in the army long enough to be leaders are fucking retarded. Right. Like, that's just the truth of it. Like, same as politicians, like in, that's in Australia In the U S is different because like, you can just be a politician, but in Australia, you have to like work your way up to like the parliamentary ranks and you have to go from bottom to top. Like that's how it works. Right. So mm. like, if you have any ounce of brain in you. Right, you're gonna get taken by private. Right, like, like, like. Do you live in New South Wales? Uh, no, no, I don't. Okay, cool. So in New South Wales, <laughs> we had a phenomenal transport manager. Right, the dude yeah. fucking revolutionized shit, made everything ten times better. Right, the moment he was up for re-election, fucking boom. I think it was Telstra, five million dollars a year salary. Right, he was like, I'm out. Right, because he's awesome yeah. at his job, and it's very obvious. Right. And so like in the military, it's the same fucking thing for the most part. You, you do get your outliers, but most of the time in the military, it's a very creatively stifling endeavor. The pay isn't very good. Right. And, 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 and like moving up in the officer rank world, which I wasn't an officer, but an officer world is just about fucking stabbing people in the back and sucking dick. Right. Like you just have to be uh, fucking super nice to people's faces and then stab them in the fucking back because there are so many, so many, so many positions. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like yeah. the really good ones just get flanked out by the really shit ones. The really good ones leave. One of the best examples of that was a guy named Ian Lanford. And he basically got fucking ran out of the military. One of the greatest officers ever in the fucking history of the military. And now he runs a think tank. Right. Like he's the head of a fucking yeah. think tank. He's a goddamn genius. Right. And he had the men rally behind him. Right. Which is terrifying for like generals. Generals are retarded. Like, they're idiots, they're morons, I'll tell that to their face, I have told that to their face, I have no problem saying that. Like, if you have managed to stay in the military for that long, you are fucking worthless, right? For the most part, there are exceptions to every rule, right? Sure. But, and like, people can yell at me, I don't care, right? I know, I was in, right? I saw the pointy end of the spear, it wasn't that pointy. You know, so, um, like, you know, so I don't, I think you get an incredibly bad example of how to manage people and how to manage careers, there, again, mm -hmm. I had one guy who I think was phenomenal, whose name, I won't say his name because he's still in. So, well, protect identities and all that kind of bullshit. But I had one guy who was a phenomenal man manager, and he was great, and I think he taught me a lot. Um, I, I think that the one thing that I figured out is that, like, there's always a solution to the problem, right? Which is, I think, in special operations, especially in snipers, as a community, it's a problem-solving community, right? Because, like, you can't not solve the problem. Otherwise, you just fucking, what are you going to do, die? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So I think like, I, I think what I learned is that like, I can do really hard things and be okay. And like, I like who I am under extreme stress, you know? So like, mm -hmm. I'm the best version of myself in the worst possible scenarios. And so like, that gives me a sense of comfort that like, there's yeah, nothing okay. I can't handle. And so like my, whenever anything bad happens and it sounds like a trope, but I go like, okay, well, something like, what's the, you know, how do we make this into a good? You know, like when catastrophic things happen, how do we make this into a good? And I think like that's one of the largest differences between people who succeed in business and people who don't is just like the, you know, instead of saying like, oh, well, you know, this is the obstacle. You say, how can I? Like if I said to you, Liam, how do you make $100,000 in the next two weeks? And you go, oh, well, I can't because, or you go, well, if I had to, this is how I would do it. And then you start thinking down that process and that line for long enough to where you go, huh, oh, I mean, give me that, I'm going to give you that crack. You know what I mean? Like, and then you try <laughs> yeah. it and like you learn stuff and maybe you make 30. It's like, oh, fuck, I just made 30 grand in two weeks. You know what I mean? Like, you're just like, oh, okay. And, and so, you know, you sort of figure that shit out. Like, how would I double my sales in three months? Like, how would I? How would you? How would you? You know you? what I mean? Well, you, everyone's different, right? But like, you've got to have a... Uh, you got to identify problems and then you got to have a strategic plan in order to actually execute on those problems. Right? If you try and solve, if you try and fix multiple things at once, you'll never learn which one actually did it. So you have to have the discipline of only fixing one thing, knowing that 10 are broken. Mm. Right? Which That's is powerful. where the real discipline comes in. Right? And so it's like, okay, I know I need to improve in these five areas, but I'm only going to work on this one for the next two weeks because if I've got 12 weeks, and five things, if I do two weeks on each one, right, then I will like solve that problem and then move on. And then I will get a tangible uptick every two weeks, right? You know, 
And that's yeah. kind of how you do it, you know, so you don't adjust your elevation and wind at the same time type thing. And I guess that really does like, do you think that you had that discipline before you went into the military or do you think the military helped focus in at least that style of problem solving of one thing like, at a time? Like or had you done that prior? Time. I don't really have an answer. I don't know. Yeah, you know, I was like, I was the kid in school. Like I was like horrific in school until I got medicated. I was, I, I got on ADHD medication, right? I was like the kid that was like a nuisance in class, class clown, tons of potential, seems smart when you talk to him, but like can't read. Right. And then mm -hmm. I got on medication and I immediately became the top of the class without having to study. So I went to like the opposite. I went from like all of like the, the retard programs into like the fucking talented and gifted, right? Like imme basically immediately. It was like a switch that happened overnight because I walked into school okay. one day on medication and I could actually hear. And I was like, oh, like the volume of the world was turned down. And so I could listen mm -hmm. and I have a very good, I had developed a phenomenal audio memory, right? Because I couldn't okay, read yeah. for shit. And so I would just listen. And by listening, I could absorb and understand. And so I like didn't do homework. I didn't study for the SATs because I grew up in the States. I fucking nailed them, right? I got into like a bunch of colleges, you know what I mean? And then like just didn't go. <laughs> Turned me on <laughs> instead. Um, I got into Duke. Uh, I got into like, yeah, everywhere I, most play, everywhere I, I applied for, I got in. Because I had like, I was a salutatorian in my high school, so I had second highest grades. Um, I was wow. the National Honor Roll Society. I was the captain of the brain ball team. I was captain of the football team. Um, and I was, um, I was, uh, um, yeah, like got a, had a really good, um, had a really good GPA, uh, like SAT score. And I finished, uh, all my high school classes by year 11. So year 12, I was like half days. Yeah. Okay. So like nice. I finished, I basically finished all the high school requirements by year 11. But you have to sort of be in year 12 because I wasn't – like I was too young. Like I could have gone to college technically I think. But like I was still in high school because like I wanted to play football. And I think I had like one mm. credit I had to do. So my last year of high school was really weird. So I had like one class that I had to do. And then I had like – because I had to be there for a certain amount of hours. Otherwise you were considered a truant, right? Because you had to be in school legally. I don't know if it's the same yeah. now but it was back then. And so I had like just all electives. Right. I don't know if it's the same way in Australia, but you have electives like so I had like a sports yeah. administration class. Literally all we did was play fantasy football, fantasy baseball. I had like um like like dude, I just did electives, like random shit that you can just do. So I just had back to back electives all day. And then I finished school at like I think it was like one thirty every day for my high school. And then I but I had to stay around because I had football practice. Right? So like <laughs> okay. I got you. <laughs> I was just fucking chilling around the school doing my thing. It was weird. It was a weird time. It was fun though. I enjoyed high school. But yeah, so, um, like the answer is like, I don't, I don't know. Like I never really had to try very hard in those scenarios because I was, your brain just enough, did it for you. I was lucky enough to have a brain that allows me to, uh, to absorb information and apply it very quickly, which is a, uh, an advantage that is not lost on me, mm. you know? So it's, it's un unfair, but I'll take it. Yeah. Well, I mean. There's no point to give it away. You can't. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, man. I That's do have awesome. to run. But no, of course. Well, Matt, I, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time and coming on. Um, it, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure. And, yeah, thanks for dropping some different knowledge bombs on us. No, I appreciate it. When's this going to come out so I don't screw up your